Hello, my name is Sharon Donovan. I am the co-chair of the Yogurt and Nutrition Initiative for a Sustainable and Healthy Diet, and I'm also virtually co-chairing our session here today. I'd like to introduce my co-chair, Olivier, Olivier Goulet, who will be joining you in Tokyo. And I would also like to thank the organizers of the IUNF ICM um, meeting for allowing us the opportunity to have our symposium today. The topic is eating to protect our planet and our, and our health. And I think you'll all agree that this is a timely and important topic. So before we get into our scientific session today, I'd like to provide a brief introduction to the Yogurt and Nutrition Initiative. So today is our 10th Uni Summit, and we're very proud of the accomplishments over the last 10 years. So briefly, Uni was formed in 2013 as a collaborative project between the Known Institute International and ASM. The mission of Uni is to advance scientific knowledge and practice on healthy, sustainable diets and the importance of all food groups to meet nutritional needs across the lifespan while respecting local cultures, affordability, and accessibility. We achieve our mission by engaging with an international board of experts. We also um, have a very active digital ecosystem, as I'll show you on the next slide. We host scientific events, such as the one today, and we publish results of those symposia in peer-reviewed journals and we also um, publish review articles, such as a recent review article in Advances in Nutrition on the topic of sustainable diets. Um, UNI also supports a small seed grant program to help young investigators launch research questions that could um, ideally lead to additional funded work. Our international online community is quite robust. We have more than 60,000 members and we have a total reach of more than 250 million people. You can see the link to our website below, and I would really encourage you to visit that website. So on this slide are just some of the materials that are available to you. These are um, oftentimes reviewing recent scientific articles, but also summarizing the latest information about yogurt, fermented foods, sustainability, and nutrition. These materials are available currently in three languages, English, French, and Spanish. And they're very um, helpful, not only for your own education, but to share with your clients if you're a healthcare provider. So will see on the right slide the different ways that you can reach us and interact with us. And I would really encourage you to engage with us in Twitter and Instagram and um, Pinterest and LinkedIn in particular. So let's now get into our scientific program. We're very excited to have three exceptional speakers today. The first speaker is Dr. Ranganathan from the World Research Sources Institute in the U.S. He'll be joining us by video to talk about creating a sustainable food future. Our second speaker, Dr. Franz Koch from the University of Wageningen in the Netherlands, will talk about balancing nutritional adequacy and environmental sustainability. What do we learn from modeling studies? And our final speaker, Dr. Jess Hain from the University of Guelph in Canada, will be speaking about food-based interventions in the family-based interventions to promote sustainable, healthy diets. Our scientific program will be followed by a live Q&A. So for those of you in Tokyo, please join us with questions. If you're joining us online, please share your questions and comments with us on social media using the hashtag Sustainable Diet 2022. Thank you, and I hope that you enjoy the program. I would also like to refer you to the booklet, which will have more extensive backgrounds on our three speakers as well as their abstracts. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today, and I wish you a successful session and a successful conference. And now it's my pleasure to turn it over to Janet as our first speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sharon, for that nice uh, introduction. I'm delighted to be here um, at the Yinni Symposium, albeit virtually. So I'm gonna to talk today about the challenge of how to feed uh, 10 billion people, almost 10 billion people in 2050. Um, I think it is what I call the, the mother of all sustainability challenges. So I um, look forward to talking to you about some of the challenges and approaches to addressing those. 
Okay, um, creating a sustainable food future. Um, I'm going to talk about specifically three challenges. We call it a tale of three gaps. Um, I'm going to talk very much about the challenge of food sustainability from a system perspective. Um, we often think about food sustainability at the field level. Um, I'm very much focusing on the system level, the global food system, but ultimately we have to bring those two perspectives together. But I will point out that what practices may appear sustainable at the feed le field level might not be at the system level and vice versa. So we need to bring those together. So let me talk about the three challenges or three gaps. The first one is that we'll need to close 11 gigaton greenhouse gas emissions mitigation gap. Let me explain what that is. Here is the emissions profile roughly today. Uh, this is the emissions for the whole economy. The yellow part is actually the contribution of, of food, which is broken into land use related emissions and production related emissions. So about a quarter of global emissions a day. This here is the business as usual scenario, um, which actually has some um, uh, uh, optimistic assumptions around yield improvements, but emissions from the agricultural sector rises to 15 gigatons. This here is the is the budget for the whole economy under the Paris Agreement of two degrees. So just reducing agricultural emissions to its share for the gap here between four and, and 15 is the 11 gigatons. And that gets us to two degrees. But if we want to get to 1.5 degrees, we have to go even lower. One other thing to notice here is that the reduction in emissions from a, from a business as usual star in 2050 to here is, is a significant reduction. In fact, 15 gigatons represents 70% of the economy-wide budget under the Paris Agreement. The second big gap that we have is closing a food gap of 56%. So um, by 2050, we won't have enough food. It's not just a distribution issue. We actually have a 56% gap, which is the difference in calories produced a day and what we we'll need to just adequately feed people in 2050. And then the third gap is a, a land gap of around 593 million hectares. That's about twice the size of India. And this is the difference between the land that's uh, devoted to agriculture today and what is projected will be needed in 2050. So a very significant land gap. So those are the three challenges, the greenhouse gas gap, the uh, food gap, and the land gap. So three big challenges, three big gaps to close. So WRI has spent the last decade plus with its partners working on how to address these. And um, we put out a number of working papers over the last five, last 10 years um, with partners. And it culminated in this flagship report, which was done with the World Resources Institute, uh, UNDP, UNEP, the World Bank, and two um, agricultural research institutes. So uh, I'm going to be largely drawing from these findings in my presentation today. First um, insight, probably no surprise, no silver bullets. We have to tackle these three challenges from both the production and consumption side. All options need to be on the table. Um, and here are some of the some of the approaches that we came out with. That's my thing here. So what you see here is the um, taking one of those gaps, the climate gap, the 11 gig gigatons. So remember, 15 gigatons is business as usual in 2050 greenhouse gas emissions. And when we have to get down to 11, um, we have to reduce it by 11 down here. So we said, how do we close that gap? What are the approaches? So um, first of all, we identify a series of what we call demand style approaches. So this is like reducing food loss and waste, shifting diets, um, and, and phase out of bio-phase fields, we, you know, getting fertility rates down to um, replacement level in places like Africa. And just to, to, to point out, the hatched areas there are the contribution from avoided land use emissions and the solid is agricultural production related emissions. We then actually looked at how do we actually increase food production on the same land or even less land without expanding agriculture. So you see a number of approaches there related to livestock um, and pasture crop productivity. Um, and then increasing fish supply. Um, and then approaches to address greenhouse gas emissions from agricultural production. And then lastly, 
to actually get to the two degrees and then down to the 1.5 degrees target, we actually have to restore um, agricultural land. So taking, agriculture, taking land out of agricultural production and putting it back into restoration. So that was a menu of 22 based approaches. So make it very clear that this is a very challenging, um, uh, this is very, it's a big challenge and we need to put all, keep all options on the table. Um, at the World Resource Institute, since producing that work, we kind of boiled it down into these kind of four themes. These are the four approaches that we need to sustainably feed the planet. So one is produce, reduce, protect, and restore. So produce is essentially that we have to produce more, whether it's meat, dairy, crops, on the same or less land. The second strategy is to reduce. That's about reducing project projected growth in demand. For a variety of foods that are land based and that have a large land footprint and then protect that's like hold the line, if not bring it back on the conversion of uh, the agricultural production line. And then uh, finally restore with a big emphasis initially on restoring um, peatland, which is a very small area of, of agricultural land globally, but has a massive greenhouse gas footprint. So produce, reduce, protect and restore. And they actually go together like we're very, very clear that actually taking actions to help Farmers that have low productivity to increase productivity have to be coupled with protect so you don't have some of these sort of um, dis, um, un, unwanted consequences. Second, the global land squeeze. There's going to be competing demand for a fixed amount of production land. If we want to protect the remaining natural ecosystems for biodiversity and carbon's perspective, we're going to have a lot of pressure on the remaining land. As Mark Twain says, they're not making land anymore. So firstly, let's talk about the past. Um, in the last um, 8,000 years, agriculture has cleared 70% of the world's grasslands, 45% of the world's temperate forests, and 27% of the tropical forests, and 50% of the wetlands. Actually, much of that happened in just the last 100 years. So it's really kind of rapidly accelerating. I'm going to move to talk a little bit about the current situation, so what's the result of that? So this is a profile, this visual is a profile of land use right now. So there's about 13 billion of hectares of land on the planet, on the terrestrial ecosystem that's ice free. And of that, the overwhelming majority of land now is devoted to production for human goods and services. So the green stuff here is for forest products. This, the, the kind of pinky colored area is for livestock productivity. And then the, uh, the crops is down here. So two thirds of agricultural land use here is for um, livestock productivity and about one third for crops. And then over here, you've got what little's left of natural ecosystems and sort of managed, lightly managed conservation areas. And then the, the built environment, think of that as a city footprint and then sort of barren land and rock. So uh, we don't have much left of what little's left of nature. So you're clear about biodiversity. You've got to hold the line on this to protect that. And what's more is that the bulk of carbon stored in the soils is actually in this area, not over here. I'm going to come back to that a little bit later. So um, now just uh, moving forward. So I've looked at the past, the present and the future. And um, this is where you start to see the pressure on land. And as uh, Mark Twain said, they're not making it anymore. So that 13 um, billion hectares is a fixed amount of area. So here's the two big drivers that are putting pressure on land. So the 40% increase in population, and then um, a, a significant growing middle class, which is important because food, the production of food is in large part um, occupying that production area land. But you see here some of the um, in pressures, increasing crop demand, meat, urban population, timber, bioenergy, um, but also pressure to actually put forests back, you know, reforest for climate reasons. And over here, you see how they translate into hectares of, hectares of land, with the big ones being the pasture land expansion, cropland expansion, um, and, and bioenergy projects, uh, bioenergy um, crops. So that um, is uh, the projected global land squeeze. And just to sort of highlight the, the discussions in Europe right now over the Ukraine energy crisis, Europe is now talking about devoting one fifth, 20% uh, of its crops 
to bioenergy. So again, that's putting pressure on land. It may be exporting food production to other parts of the world where there actually are still remaining natural ecosystems and putting pressure on them. So more people, more food, fill, feed and fill, more pressure for reforestation for carbon storage purposes, a fixed land area, land efficiency in agricultural production becomes absolutely crucial. Third insight, an outsized role, role for reducing demand. Typically, we've traditionally we focused only on the production side of agriculture when thinking about sustainability, but we have to think a lot more about consumption and the demand side going forward. So um, just going back to the waterfall chart, um, let's get this one here. Um, remember the, the greenhouse gas gap here um, and then the whole variety of solutions, but I'm just going to point out the two big ones here, which is reducing food loss and waste and shifting diets, both, both uh, demand side approaches. And this uh, contribution here is from our uh, scenario of reducing food loss and waste by 25% between now and 2050. Right now, a quarter of, uh, a quarter of food uh, by calories between field and pork is, is wasted. So we're trying to cut that by 25%. The shifting diets is particularly focused on reducing ruminant meat, which is from goat, sheep, um, and cattle. And there the scenario was to get everyone, no one eating more than 1.5 hamburgers a week. But you can see that they, they have a significant, they take a significant chunk out of this greenhouse gas gap. And if you, if you look at the um, same analysis, but this time, rather than looking at the greenhouse gas emission, we're looking at that land gap. Remember, it was 600 million hectares. And again, you can see these two approaches take a big chunk. They actually, you know, they reduce and actually shrink the need for land in the agricultural system. So really important um, demand side approaches. Fourth insight, ruminant are a big problem. So that's beef, lamb and goat because of the production related emissions and the land use associated with their production. So I think this, uh, oops, sorry. I think this uh, visual explains it. Um, sorry, it's a little bit small from you, but you've got three little, you've got, you've got different kinds of uh, protein sources here. On the left of this line, plant-based wheat, rice, <clears throat> etc. To the right of the line, animal-based protein sources. And for each of these, we're looking at three things, land use, freshwater consumption, and GHG emissions. The thing to focus on here, though, this is beef. This is dairy over here. These are all plant-based. So beef um, has an outsized impact on uh, land, freshwater, and GHG emissions. Just by the way, this darker bit of the yellow is greenhouse gas emissions from land use, production-related emissions there. So. Beef requires 20 times as much land and produces 20 times as much greenhouse gas emissions than your average plant-based protein. So just looking at the average US and world per capita protein consumption, um, and I should say US is actually includes information from, from Canada and consumption here, but here's the profile of, of the um, pro protein consumption of your average world citizen. So just over a half coming from plant-based protein here. This is from other animal-based sources, dairy there with beef at the very top. This is the average US kind of Canadian citizen and their protein. They eat a lot less plant-based protein. They eat a lot of plant-based protein, but a small amount of beef here. I'm gonna talk about how that translates into the greenhouse gas footprint in a minute. But just to also note that the FAO talks about 55 grams of protein per person per day. So even the, the average world citizen is eating more protein than they actually need for their dietary requirements. So how does that translate into uh, GHG emissions? So you're just going back, that red area there, which is the um, percentage of protein from, um, from ruminant meat, from beef in particular, has an outsized um, impact on the overall emissions footprint of your average US citizen. And um, same for, for land, same thing here. So they, they, they track. Um, I don't wanna think about ruminant meat though, just from a consumption point of view, although that's really important. I think also how we produce, because there's always gonna be, people are always gonna eat meat and red meat in particular, 
So we also have to think about how do we produce that more efficiently, because that will also have a significant factor on the GHG emissions associated with it. And here there's a big opportunity. This graph just shows differences in efficiencies in beef production vary by a factor of three across the globe. So increasing those efficiencies in places like um, Sub-Saharan Africa and India will help to reduce the emissions associated with beef consumption. Likewise, um, more efficient milk production, uh, more, more milk per cow, again, significantly reduces the greenhouse gas emissions dramatically. And there's big opportunities across the globe to focus on that too. So um, just a little aside here, if all the cattle in the world came together and formed their own nation, they would be the third largest emitter after um, China and the US. And if they went to the, the next COP in um, Cairo, uh, in Egypt, I wonder what, what position they would take at the negotiating table. But maybe it might be something like this, eat more chicken or, or plant-based protein. Last insight, um, questions around the role of agricultural soil carbon sequestration in agricultural systems. So I'm going to provide some insights into why we think it may have a, a, a more limited role. So um, chapter 30 of our Creating a Sustainable Food Forum addressed this specific issue of agricultural soil carbon sequestration. And here's a few um, pointers from that, a few observations. So first of all, the initial hype around agricultural soil carbon came from some big numbers that were in an IPCC report. And I wanna point out that those numbers um, for the most part, focused on technical potential. Technical potential is what theoretically could be stored in soils. That is not the same as what is feasible or what is sort of economically um, um, feasible. Also, some of those big numbers, they intermingled what I would call non-agricultural practices, such as like restoring, like converting pasture land back into forests or actually restoring um, degraded areas um, back systems or even forest protection. Those were where the big numbers were. The big numbers weren't as much in agricultural production practices. Thirdly, um, some agricultural practices believed to initially be, be promising have now been questioned. So an example here is no tillage agriculture. The first thought to accumulate a significant amount of soil carbon and certainly does at the first 15 centimeters level. But when, when researchers went back and looked at carbon across the profile at deeper levels, they found there wasn't any, there wasn't significant changes. That compounded with the fact that most farmers here in the United States will always plow at some point in five, six, seven years. So the benefits get lost. Um, so the science is still complex and evolving on this issue of, of soil, soil carbon, particularly in the context of agricultural practices. There are also GHG measurement and accounting challenges. A GHG measurement challenge at the field level, even in a single field, there's significant heterogeneity of soil carbon based on one part of the sampled in one part of the field versus another. But there are also broader accounting challenges, and this gets to system level issues. Is you can't just look at carbon at the field level; you have to look at the impacts of those practices outside the field level. So if you're just moving manure from one place to another. Of course, you're going to get sequestration, but there isn't any net effect because you just moved it from one to the other. And then um, the, the, the challenge of, a, you know, if you're going to get um, if you're going to get soil carbon sequestration, you also have to put nitrogen in at a ratio of one to 12, which has its own GHG challenges and water water linked problems, too. So our conclusions was that. Soil carbon is critical to soil health. It plays a, a significant role in helping with climate adaptation. But we saw a more, much more limited role for it uh, in large scale climate mitigation. With perhaps the biggest prize on soil carbon being if we can actually implement practices in the agricultural system that protect the very large reservoirs of soil carbon in natural ecosystems. So the issue again of land efficiency and productivity becomes very very um, important there. So in summary, no silver bullet, produce, protect, reduce and restore, use land efficiently, big demand side challenge, we need to reduce demand fairly. Um, it can't be expecting people that don't eat much meat these days to be cutting. We have to cut from some of the high consuming countries first um, and in every way we can. 
Third, it's the ruminants, cattle, sheep, and goat. They have an outsized um, impact on land, water, and greenhouse gas emissions. Fifth, we need to produce more on the same land or less, more per animal, per liter of water, and kilogram of nitrogen. So efficiency becomes really important. We have to, we have to pair that with reducing impact at the field level. And then finally, the role of agricultural soil carbon, good for soil health, but questions around its role in mitigating climate change. Um, great, that's uh, a, an easy question. My presentation focused on it, but uh, the three big gaps are the greenhouse gas emissions reduction gap between expected business as usual agricultural emissions and what we need to be compliant with a 1.5 degrees um, climate scenario. The second one is the food gap, which is 56% um, increase we need in food production just to meet people's um, dietary needs in 2050. And then the third one is the land gap, the gap between what, what land we use today to produce food and what is projected to be needed in, in 2050, which is around 600 million hectares or twice the size of India. But closing those three gaps is the paramount challenge facing um, the food system. So um, the focus um, should be on high consuming countries like Europe, the US, um, that consume a lot of protein. Um, and the focus should be on dairy and ruminant meat. Um, so lamb, beef, goat, in particular beef, because that's the most consumed protein. Um, and how to do that, um, information and information campaigns, in my view, is a blunt instrument. It's necessary, but it's not suffice. We need to use some of the behavioral economics and marketing approaches. Um, you know, the power of language in how you, you present food in menus, um, in a, a restaurant setting, and so on and so forth. But the focus should be in high consuming countries, you know, beef and dairy, and recognizing that we're over consuming protein. There's no risk here that uh, people in those countries are going to go about. In fact, in the US, the average male is consuming twice as much protein as they they need for their dietary requirements. Um, simply just because of the amount that you can produce per animal um, relative to meat. So it all comes from how much land per given amount of protein that you supply. So you get a lot more milk over the, the life of the cow um, than, than, you, than you do from, from the meat. So, as I understand your question, it's um, of the 22 approaches that I shared, what, what are the easiest? Um, I, I don't think any of them are easy. E even things like reducing food loss and waste, which you'd be thinking of as a no-brainer, is really difficult because it, if you look at the food value chain, you have these kind of, you know, it's 25% of food, of calories between field and pork that loss happens at multiple places. So there's no sort of, a, again, there's no silver bullet for how you solve food loss and waste. Um, shifting diets, you know, it, it, it's difficult. Um, people, you know, grow up with particular kinds of diets. So we, I, I think, I think it's, it's, just, it's just very difficult. And even things like crop yield, we're already building in um, assumptions around business as usual crop production, productivity increases. So what you saw on that diagram was, and let's go another 25% more in terms of productivity than we've had previously. So I, I think there's no easy approach here. Um, it, it's like, as I said, we, we've really got to invest more research and funds in how to do this. Um, if you look at the two big climate problems of the economy, it's, it's energy system and the food system. If you look at how much has been spent on trying to invest in mitigation approaches, Enormous amounts have gone into the energy system. Very little has been spent um, on agricultural systems. So we need to change that. So 
although I've said that the approaches to addressing the problem are difficult, the good news here is that the answers are no. We know how to do this. We just need to sort of like consistently, you know, scale up some of these approaches. In, in terms of the issue of carbon soil sequestration specifically, yes, there are good practices. I mean, I would put cover crops in there, agroforestry as an example. It's just that the, the, the amount of soil carbon sequestered there is quite small relative to the amounts in, um, in natural ecosystems. So you have to be very careful that the practices that you implement to increase soil carbon sequestration at the field level aren't at the expense of productivity. And remember, I, we need to increase productivity, not, not hold it the same. We need to increase productivity and then some more. So if you take action to increase, like you might reduce the stocking of cattle in pasture land to increase the soil carbon sequestration. But if that now means that the fact that you know, there's 70% more demand going forward between now and 2050 for livestock, then that becomes, a, okay, you've increased the carbon at the farm level, but the agricultural frontier, the pasture frontier now expands that the overall effects of that at the system level are really significant. So yeah, there are practices that can be done, but I think, as I said, the biggest prize on soil carbon sequestration is holding the frontier on the agricultural, the agricultural frontier and actually moving it backwards, freeing up land to liberate so that you can sequester more carbon in natural ecosystems. So um, I just wanted to end there um, and say a big thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today. I really wish I was there and I wish you all a successful symposium. I will be thinking of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Janet, for your outstanding presentation about the challenge and the target for 2050. And thank you for answering the question. You are all connected at these outside participants, and they are invited to ask you a your question. It's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, with uh, Professor Hans Koch. Hans Koch is an emeritus professor in nutrition and health, and a former head of the Division of Human Nutrition at Wayne University in the Netherlands. Thank you very much, Hans, for giving the talk. Balancing nutritional adequacy and environmental sustainability, what do we learn from modeling studies? Thank you very much, Olivier. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you have heard, uh, I think, a very nice systems approach by uh, Janet before. And I will discuss with you the uh, modeling studies for uh, healthy and sustainable diets and uh, give special, special attention to uh, nutritional adequacy. Uh, these are my disclosures, uh, not so many as a, a nearly just professor, you can see. Um, and my first slide uh, is uh, showing the association, the impact of food groups on health and the environment. Uh, on the y-axis, you see the, uh, the environmental impact of food groups, and on the x-axis, the uh, impact on health uh, expressed as the relative risk of mortality. And if you see uh, in the red uh, circle, or ellipse it is, uh, you see uh, the unprocessed and processed meat, we have heard that already, as the major contributions contributors of both um, environmental impact as well as impact on health. A more moderate uh, level is uh, shown for chicken, fish, dairy and eggs, um, and uh, a low level for whole grains, uh, vegetables, fruits, nuts, legumes, etc. And if you look at the nutritional benefits, on average one can say that uh, these are the contributions to the nutritional effort, uh, benefits for the different um, food groups. Um, you have heard a lot about uh, business as usual and greenhouse gas emissions. And it's clear from this slide that most of the food-based dietary guidelines in the world are inconsistent with this 1.5 degree target. Uh, as uh, we know from the 2050 Paris Agreement. 
Um, you see here the boxes uh, for different countries on the x-axis and on the y-axis, the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, you see quite much difference between lands. And if you look at the, uh, the left uh, column, then you see um, business as usual. You have seen it with uh, huge uh, exposures. Um, whereas if you would uh, uh, adhere to the 1.5, it's much lower. And um, what you also see in, dot, in the dotted lines that um, the food waste related greenhouse gas emissions are also quite tremendous. If you then see in the yellow boxes, you see the contributions of animal products to the greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, the blue uh, color is uh, the red meat and the green is the dairy, showing that they are the major contributors. So I think we have quite a huge challenge to change uh, the food production and food consumption to levels that come uh, come close or even below this level and as you can see the WHO healthy diet recommendations are in fact also uh, uh, advising or recommending uh, this uh, level. The Eat Lancet Commission has uh, produced uh, the Lancet reference diet also known as the planetary health plate and from this plate, you see that we need to increase a lot of the fruit and vegetable consumption, whole grains, uh, starchy vegetables, plant proteins from uh, nuts and from legumes, etc., and beans, and reduce the, the uh, intake of animal protein. Uh, and for dairy, uh, dairy would be around zero to two servings per day. And indeed, this is a, a global picture, uh, and I will come to that later because we need much more modeling studies on a regional and national level to bring in sustainability in food-based dietary guidelines. Um, what the Eat Lancet also has done very nicely as they use the reference diet of the Lancet to uh, come up with scenarios of environmental effects in the food system. And uh, what you see here on the, uh, the horizontal first line is food production boundaries for greenhouse gas emissions and for other uh, uh, parameters, problem use, water use, nitrogen application, phosphate application, and also uh, biodiversity. And the baseline is the, the second line, uh, and you can already see that uh, at this stage in 2010, um, there is already quite some red uh, boxes here indicating that we are going, we are exceeding the, the borders. And what they did is they pro projected uh, the, to 2050 and looked at production, waste, and diet. And this uh, red box shows if we wouldn't do anything at this stage. So business as usual for food production, full waste like it is now and based and, and business as usual in the diet. Then you see that these red boxes are increasing uh, quite substantially. And if you look at the reference, the Lancet reference diet, it's, it's already becoming a little better. Uh, also, dietary regimens, uh, if everybody would become a vegetarian or vegan, that would help uh, quite substantially, uh, but it's probably not necessary, I will show you later. And this box here shows if we would improve the production practice with 20% or so, not even more, half the waste of, uh, half the waste and uh, business as usual, and you see not much changed. But uh, for the Lancet reference diet, the colors are becoming uh, better. So a huge challenge, but uh, uh, we have to do a lot in order to have a healthy uh, and sustainable planet in 2050. You look at modeling studies, uh, most of the time the modeling studies are making use of health nutrition uh, data and environmental data. 
And um, so what, what really is needed in the modeling studies is to also include uh, variables that are more on an economic level uh, relating to accessibility, uh, affordability, economic share, and also social cultural uh, aspects uh, like the, the type of food uh, patterns, dieting patterns people have. And this is necessary because they, this might um, uh, help to, to, to accelerate the food transition and it is probably a more effective way if you uh, include also the other variables and that again on a national and regional level. There are two types of global, two types of, of modeling uh, studies. The one is, the first one is on observational and replacement studies making use of current diets, recommended diets, or, or dietary regimens. And the other one will be coming in a few minutes. I will uh, show a few slides because there's, there's quite some research going around. But to give you an impression, uh, this is a systematic review of 63 studies where you see the environmental benefits if we would shift uh, from current to more sustainable diets. And uh, you see that with dietary regimens like the one here and here, you see that you find quite tremendous uh, differences, decreases in, in greenhouse gas emissions. And also the land and water use will be much better because that was also taken into account. Um, there are a number of other uh, ways which are not contributing a lot. Um, but uh, also meat and dairy partly replaced by plant food studies are only five studies, but showing quite uh, important changes, which are already coming close to what we would need in order to achieve uh, our goals. <laughs> this slide is uh, uh, from the experiment uh, showing health and environmental impacts of dietary change projected to 2030. And this is making use of data from 150 countries all over the world and using food balance sheets uh, of the FAO. And this, these are often not very accurate. So you, there is a lot of uncertainty about these figures. You would prefer to have individual food consumption data and I will show later because they are more accurate. But if you look at, uh, if you, for example, in the upper bar, if you would replace all the animal source foods by plant-based ones, uh, then you see enormous uh, reductions. The same holds for, uh, if you would uh, have flexitarian diets with not a lot of meat and dairy, and also balance for calories, you'll also see benefits. Benefits both in the, uh, parameters uh, on, uh, on climate change and, and land use, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and also quite tremendously in premature mortality. Um, so this this information was also used uh, for looking at the nu nutrient adequacy of dietary scenarios. And I, again, you have to keep in mind that these are food balance sheets, so. They are not too accurate. But anyway, um, if you look here at the recommendation for a number of vitamins and minerals, you see here the borders, uh, the recommendations. This is the, the, the baseline in 2010. And as you can see, there are quite some red boxes indicating that it's either too low or too high in terms of uh, intake of these some of these micronutrients. Um, and what, uh, what has been done by Springman is uh, he uh, projected or he made a scenario that uh, animal source foods would be reduced by 25%, 50%, 75% or 100%. And they also, he also looked at some dietary regimens, specific plant-based. And um, what you see here is when it's in fact three um, calcium and two vitamins are a little, little bit at stake. Uh, uh, you see it in the, in the yellow boxes. What you also see is that all the other uh, numbers are becoming green. That are, so that is 
a, a very nice effect as well. So there are uh, potentially vulnerable vitamins and minerals depending on how you change your diet. But the good news is, is that if you plan your diet well, then in fact there is uh, almost no issue. And if necessary, you could use uh, supplements or fortified foods, uh, which are available nowadays as well. So, but for vegetarian diets, thank you for for protein quality, uh, omega-3 fatty acids, B12, B, calcium, iron, zinc, is based on a literature review. And in the systematic uh, review of 48 studies, you see for veganism that there are some other vitamins and uh, minerals uh, that are potentially uh, vulnerable as well. I picked out the, uh, the amino acids, especially the indispensable amino acids, uh, because protein quality is an important issue. Uh, and especially um, in, in low and middle income countries, the total amount of uh, uh, proteins are important, but in, in addition, also the quality. So what is indicated here is that they have compared plant protein plants, and you see here that such uh, one example of a plant, beans and potato protein and other bean and uh, pea albumin, uh, this combination, they, they compared this plant protein with cow milk and chicken meat uh, with respect to indispensable proteins. And as you can see, the blue uh, profile is really overlapping the red profile. So this is a very optimal uh, protein blend. This is for cow milk and this is for chicken meat, which is also quite similar. And if you look, there are more examples given. But if you look, then uh, in fact, if there are problems, they, they might be for a specific indispensable amino acid, it might be isoleucine, lysine, uh, or histidine. But as I said, if you mix uh, your uh, diet with uh, different plant proteins, then in general, you don't have any problem with the protein quality. The optimization studies is the second group of studies uh, for modeling. And, and these type of studies, they maximize healthy eating and nutrient adequacy. They minimize environmental impact, greenhouse gas, but also other uh, parameters. And they can put in constraints. So they can put in economic and social cultural aspects like uh, acceptability, affordability, accessibility. If you have data, of course, about this. They can also uh, put constraints on technological innovation. One can imagine that in agriculture, but also in the in the food that uh, with respect to meat replacers or uh, fortification or supplementation that you have uh, possibilities to const make constraints and also food chain interdependencies, for example, beef and milk, because you, you can, uh, that's a food inter inter interdependency because you cannot uh, have milk without cows or with, uh, without the cattle. So that's a, a constraint as well. The models they are using are benchmarking and food and diet based. This is an example of a person who is from Dr. Mertens, who is in the audience. She's sitting there from Wageningen. It's her PhD work. Um, this is, uh, and I hope I, I, I tell it rightly. <laughs> anyway, um, Four countries in, in Europe, Denmark, Czech Republic, Italy, and France, using individual uh, food consumption data in, in these countries. They looked also at the greenhouse gas emissions. And as you can see, there's quite some variation in, in already within Europe. Um, and again, red and processed meat and milk and cheese, they are the major contributors of uh, the greenhouse gas emissions. And what they, uh, what they did uh, is to, uh, to model, uh, to optimize, to come up with an optimized diet. Uh, so they model the diet looking at the nutrition adequacy, but also, of course, health and, and, and environmental impact, but also things that, that the diet should be still realistic and also should be uh, afforded. And this is shown in this slide. Uh, I will help you through. 
before the uh, box is before the uh, box is here. Sorry, before uh, the box is here. They are uh, uh, representing males. These are females. And, uh, and on the left side, you see for the four countries the observed uh, uh, dietary intake, uh, but also the amount of greenhouse gas uh, emission. Uh, on the right side, it is uh, what the Lancet reference diet is saying. And in between, there are uh, two types. This is the maximum uh, sustainability, country specific, where they have benchmark diets. Uh, making use of best practices within a country, and here they have done it on a European level. You can see that the green is the, the legumes and fruit and vegetables that love the eat plants. It is in the very high high column. Uh, in Europe, it's, it's not very high currently, and it you see how it need to change in order to achieve the 1.5 degree. Uh, the red boxes, the dark red boxes, they show the, the, the meat, uh, and you see here the fish and the eggs also in the red, and as you can see, the, uh, the Lancet uh, has, of course, not, not a lot of uh, red meat, etc., in the diet anymore. This is the current situation. It is not, not changing a lot uh, coming close to this, but this is because within the category of of animal uh, products uh, of, of meat, you make changes to uh, less uh, uh, less red meat and more of the other types. And with respect to dairy, you can see the blue bars here, uh, yeah. where you see that again, this is not changing a lot. But what is important, if you look at it more specifically, that you go from uh, cheese and butter much more to liquid dairy, uh, including yogurt. Uh, so the consumption can be uh, quite similar. And EU-wide, EU-wide benchmark, but also the country one, may result in a 31% decrease in greenhouse gas emissions in 2030, which is quite nice. This is a specific study in the Netherlands, uh, also making use of individual food consumption data. Uh, with uh, two scenarios for 2030 and 2050 for sustainable diets. Dairy, the Netherlands is really a dairy country, so we are using quite some dairy. And uh, you see from the from these uh, uh, circles here that uh, as you expect, would expect green and uh, grains and starches and vegetables, fruits, they have to increase very much. I will come to the specific data in the next slide. Uh, you see that dairy is, is, is uh, changing uh, quite uh, strongly for the 2030, not so, yeah, for the 2030 less, but for the 2050 scenario. And the meat is completely disappearing. Uh, and instead of this meat, we will eat more protein in soy foods. You can see the green bar is bigger. And also, uh, the, the green bar here is the, the soy drinks, especially in 2050, because we don't have a, a lot of other components. So this is the, the, the slide with the data. Um, and, and I have expressed here the, the, the baseline, the 2030 scenario, the 2050 scenario, and the vegan scenario. You see that uh, beef and lamb is, is, is disappearing, no consumption anymore. Uh, the rest is, is decreasing for 2030. And would uh, not be eaten anymore except for fish and shellfish in 2050. Uh, and then you see here the, the, the dairy, the cheese is disappearing from the plate, liquid dairy is still present, butter is disappearing. Um, and you can see, see here the soy drinks, which are also increasing dramatically because we don't have other products uh, yet enough to. Uh, to to have on our plate. And that's exactly the criticism because you see that the, the diversity in the diet is really uh, decreased very much in 2050. So uh, yeah, uh, it is also quite uncertain whether this would be the pattern. And it, a lot can be changed, of course. And um, you see here that the yogurt intake uh, 
the, the current intake is 77 grams, will not change and even increase a little bit. I come to my three final conclusions of first uh, of the modeling studies. Um, I hope I uh, made clear to you that regional uh, and national modeling studies are really needed, including especially the, the low and middle income countries, uh, to, uh, to come up with food-based dietary guidelines, which include much more sustainability issues because I haven't shown any data from Asia and Africa here. So you can imagine that, uh, for example, the animal protein is still much, uh, much more required, not much more, but still required in, in, in those countries. And, and of course, dairy is a completely different story in, in several other regional and national uh, areas. The second point is that important is that we model uh, economic and sociocultural dimensions because that, as I mentioned, accelerates dietary changes and makes also food transition more effective. And that is, I think, uh, then, uh, crucial. And I think we need to work more intensively with social sciences in this respect, and also from with economic researchers. And then, um, with respect to the innovations and every in agriculture and food technology, they will. Uh, for sure, a lead for the coming years to alter the food supply. You will, we will have new food recipes, new recipes, new meat replacers, reformulated foods, and that will also change uh, the modeling and also the results to achieve uh, a healthy and a sustainable planet. With respect to conclusions uh, from health and environmental impacts, uh, I've shown that greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the e Lancet asks for 50% target, and that would indeed require, an, in, in addition, uh, transitions in, in, in food production and processing, and very important is loss and weight of food. And with respect to nutrient adequacy, plant based diets, uh, if you plan them uh, well, uh, these solutions can provide the required nutrients. Uh, it should be said that we don't have to all go to a vegetarian or a, a vegan diet. Of course, these are very nice uh, dietary regimens, uh, but uh, I mean, there is still room for, for meat and for, for dairy, but um, it is important that we work on it. And finally, if then I talk about yogurt, Yogurt, uh, first we have the ring order and global warming. It's beef, other meat, uh, cheese, milk, eggs, fish, and plant products. Um, daily intake of 250 grams of milk or derivatives. Um, and for example, yogurt fits in future sustainable diets on average. The Lancet reference diet, uh, by the way, it, it talks about a range of one of zero to 500 grams. And yogurt is of special interest because it's nutrient rich, it's low fat content, and it has a moderate environmental impact. I thank you for the attention. Thank you very, thank you very much, Franz, for uh, this very outstanding talk. Uh, our future dates is not uh, so. I think if we have to reduce so many food, we know. But anyway, you say it's the yogurt. The talk is open to the discussion for two or questions with the group. Yes, please. Can you let me introduce yourself, please? Thank you. I am the Abdullah from the also from the Netherlands. Uh, well, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. There's a lot of modeling studies. Uh, I was involved in some modeling studies about health which economics, and I was surprised by the very big savings in medical costs if diets are improved. And we will face in the future also a I mean, huge uh, healthcare problems in the Netherlands uh, in 2050, but we can't run Three people who work in healthcare, 
Thank you so much. And for instance, you know, you know I am in mean, those of the grains. If Americans would eat one slice of whole grain bread more uh, ever, or whatever, that will save uh, 17 billion of US dollars in our reviews. So I think I want to first of all, I'm wondering if you include that we have to include some of those uh, medical costings, and we also help the convincing governments that it is not only nice, but it is also good in perspective. I, I, I completely uh, agree, uh, Jan Miller. Um, in fact, uh, the health economics had uh, a cost benefit an analysis, cost benefit analysis are crucial and um, are required and um, it should be done. Uh, and it also relates to the previous uh, talk by, by Janet, uh, because I think we, we should become much more active as a nutrition society to really show the politicians and the policy makers that if you go for prevention um, and you, you, you put the, the emphasis right, that in fact, uh, uh, yeah, in compare prevention with the medical cost, then, uh, then I think we are doing a very good job and I think the attention should go much more in that direction. Completely agree. Well, very short remarks, excuse me. And then I'm going to be going to the other one. Okay. Because there are three notes. Very short. In the break, uh, Jan. Okay. Yeah, very short. Hi, my name is Amado Perez Puerto. Uh, and I would like to ask you whether you have uh, considered uh, animal feed as food waste in your modeling because the inefficiency of uh, producing uh, animal crops that provide lots of energy uh, goes to the, for example, the cow or the, mm -hmm. um, yeah, for the cow for the yeah. so one, and then you get three, for every 100 calories, you get three of meat and about 20 of meat. Yeah. I, I agree that this, the whole food waste part, so you both in lines, these are quite crude uh, measures. And, and, and persons like you who really can identify what, what contribution is of each of the parts eh, in agriculture are desperately needed to, uh, to come up with better figures. So, so I cannot give you an answer, but I probably agree completely with you. Oh, but it's just a suggestion. Yeah, no, no, but, but, but it's a good idea. Thank you. Ladies first. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, thank you. Thanks, uh, Fats. Um, on the protein, uh, I like your uh, spider uh, diagram, but I also noticed that the dietary diversity of the protein source really needs to increase if you want to have the, the right protein quality. And also that the source of the proteins becomes rather large. So if you compare animal source protein and plant source protein for the same diversity, you need more food from the plant source. And I think it's also good in those discussions to recognize the micronutrient content of animal source foods. Yeah. So if you're improving diets in the low middle income countries, it's not only about the protein that they bring, it's also about the other uh, nutrients. And then um, I'm always a bit troubled if we take the global analysis and then we'll talk about so, yeah, improving diets um, and that that will reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. It really depends on what your starting point is. But the diet is non diverse to start with, it will actually increase. And that's fine. You know, we need that health and we need to balance that. But it's not necessarily driving down greenhouse gas emissions everywhere. Okay. Yeah, Saskia, I, I agree completely, and, and, and especially in um, low middle income countries, where the problems of proteins and protein uh, quality. And, also availability of micronutrients and, and also dietary diversity. These are all elements that should in fact be built in um, a lot, much more. And uh, so, yeah, as I mentioned, we all are waiting for more studies from these regions to, to learn the specifics uh, as uh, really to Thank you. Thank you. No, 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 thank you. <laughs> it's for a long time. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for providing this talk, Franz. I enjoyed it. Um, Mitch Cantor with the Global Dairy Platform. I had several um, comments, observations. I'll limit them to a couple. One, just picking up on the last point about protein diversity. I would add to that that in your model, if you came up with these plant blends to replace 
animal source foods, there are projections that you might have to consume 20% more calories in order to get an equivalent amount of essential amino acids, which obviously has implications for land use as well as caloric consumption and costs and overweight. So in fairness, I think that's worth pointing out. The other couple of quick things, um, you made a point as the Janet in the first presentation about land use if we were to do away with animal source foods, if we removed ruminants and replaced them with crops um, that would help with greenhouse gases. To be sure that's true, but it's also fair to point out that about 70% or thereabout of the land that these ruminants raise on is not going to have a land bank. So you took them off the, the land, you're not going to be able to grow your crops anyway. So Okay, but, but I again agree, uh, and I'm not an advocate of removing all the cattle uh, and don't eat any dairy. Uh, but of course, you are um, cautious, and, 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 and that's right. That, that it's not a simple story if you would go to plant proteins uh, and simply forget about the animal. That, that's true. It, it's and it depends on where on earth you, you are living. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Hello. Awesome. I'm, I'm Rina Agustina from uh, Human and Fish Research Center uh, in Jonas, Indonesia. And I happen to be a professor of France, a PhD student a long time ago. So a very nice presentation, Franz. Um, I have uh, two questions, very technical questions uh, regarding the AIDS. There's a uh, planetary healthy diets uh, recommend about 1.5 pieces a week for uh, uh, eggs. In the model of Netherlands, it shows that the reduction to 17 to 0. So what would be uh, the concentration on that in 2050? Is there any consideration in relation to the uh, increasing of diabetes? Or because we are now actually talking about that in the Atlantic Commission uh, uh, second. Uh, to highlight on eggs, because eggs is very important uh, quality of protein, especially for developing countries, and it's not actually recommended to take them out. So I would like to know what is the consideration on that. And second question is on the, uh, uh, the whole grain that in the modeling. Um, so there's a room of refined grain. So uh, this is a long discussion, especially in Indonesia. We have a very large consumption of the refined grain for uh, white rice. And it's absolutely, it's, it's not really much on environment, it's very much on the health aspect, which is a high, uh, high, uh, what was that, um, uh, person index. So, what do you think that would be the shift on that refined grain in that developing countries to meet the, uh, the target of the both gas emission as well as the sustainable uh, development goal. Thank you. Okay, yeah, to, to start with the last question, um, I don't think that uh, everybody in Indonesia will change from uh, whole grain, rice, whole, yeah, whole, but, but stick. I mean, what? In fact, if you look okay. at the traditional ones, I'm sorry, yeah. but we have to. We will talk food. about it. In yes, during the break, the coffee break, <laughs> and it's my pleasure to introduce now Jess Ains <laughs> with with associate professor of applied nutrition at the University of Guelph in Canada. Thank you, sir. Oh, thank you. Um, as both friends and Jan mentioned, one of the key things we think of as a sustainable food system is changing the consumer, that consumer diet. So I want to share some of the work we've been doing in Canada uh, to promote healthy and sustainable diets among families. Well, I listen, I hope you might be able to hear a tip or a recipe that you might want to try in your own house uh, to have a more healthy and sustainable diet. So first, what are we talking about when we think about sustainable healthy diet? So up here on the screen is the um, definition by the FAO and WHO. Behaviors that actually are healthy and sustainable. 
In our work, we focus on three key behaviors. We focus on eating more plant-based proteins, uh, cooking more meals at home, and this is a way to reduce processed food intake, as well as reducing food waste. Thinking about that first behavior, as um, Fran showed in his um, presentation, this is the Eat Lancet diet on the left-hand side. And this shows a diet that's a helpful diet, as well as one that is supportive of planetary health. On the right-hand side is what we're actually eating. And particularly in high-income countries like Canada, we're eating far too many animal-based proteins. So finding a way to promote more plant-based proteins as a way to replace some of that ruminant uh, plant-based or animal-based protein is one way we can have a sustainable yeah. and healthy diet. We are also eating far too many processed foods. And we know that these processed foods are certainly associated with adverse health outcomes, but also many of the ingredients that are in these highly processed foods are high yields, um, inexpensive in ingredients that have a detrimental effect on biodiversity. So this important environmental impact as well. And as the recent um, Global Diet Quality Project just showed, recently showed, in those high-income countries, not only do we have, we certainly have more access to healthy foods, but you can see by the light green bars on the, on the right-hand side, that's also, we also have a high intake of that highly processed foods. And in Canada, that's about 40% of our intake. So certainly some work we can do to reduce that process intake, um, highly processed intake. One way to do that is by having more meals at home. We also throw away far too much food. So one third of the food that's produced is uh, lost or wasted. In high income countries, a large majority of that food waste actually happens at the household income, uh, household level. With some colleagues at the University of Guelph, so both food uh, waste experts as well as economists, we did one of the most detailed assessment of food waste within families. We looked at um, food waste from 100 families and we collected everything they threw away over four weeks. And then we took a look to see what was, what was thrown away uh, and how much. What we found was that families threw away about three kilos of avoidable food waste each week. Avoidable food waste is that stuff that had we managed it better, we could have eaten it. So think about those strawberries that are going bad at the back of your fridge. Looking at the impact of that food waste, we found that that amount of food waste translates to about $20 worth of food, of food um, that's been purchased that ends up in the garbage each week. Over the year, that equals about $1,000. As we say to families, it's like going to the grocery store and leaving one of your grocery bags behind every week. So the food waste also has really substantial impacts on the environment. When we think about greenhouse gas emissions that are associated with the production of that food that ends up in our bin, that's about 23 kilograms of carbon dioxide each week, up to about 1,200 over the, over the year. That's about driving a car for half the year. So pretty substantial greenhouse gas emissions. And given we're in a nutrition conference, there's also a lot of calories that are being thrown away, right? So about 3,400 calories. Now, again, because we're nutritionists, many of us, we're not just so concerned about how many calories, but the quality of what's being thrown away. So we did a detailed assessment to see what are people throwing away. And in fact, families were throwing a vast majority of what they threw away was fruits and vegetables. So this got us thinking, is there a way that we can help families uh, reduce the amount of food waste, which would have important economic and environmental impacts, but also dietary impacts? Could we have them increase their intake of fruit and vegetable? So what we did to do that is we created a recipe book called Rock What You've Got. Um, this was uh, the recipe book comes with tips. So we partnered with Love Food, Hate Waste in Canada. And so the beginning part of the cookbook has specific tips for families to plan out their food, to store the food right, and to use it up as ways to reduce, um, reduce the food waste. And the link here that you can see on the next two slides is where you can find your free copy of Rock What You've Got. We also partnered with culinary arts uh, students and staff at a local college and created 30 recipes that help families reduce the amount of food waste they have. 
So my favorite uh, uh, recipe that we have is a coconut one pot wonder. And what that is, is it's sort of a fridge cleanup recipe. You can use whatever vegetable they're going bad, um, add a can of coconut meat and some protein, and in 10 minutes you have a delicious dinner. We also have recipes that are these two-in-one recipes that show families how they can use some of the leftover food to have delicious leftovers the next day as a way to sort of uh, change the, the, the sort of reputation of leftovers. So our recipe book had a really strong um, uptake. We've had over 15,000 downloads, which was exciting. Uh, it's particularly been, um, the, although we designed it for families, college campuses have really liked it, so young adults have been very interested. And this brought us excited, um, but we also started to wonder as scientists, you know, is, does the cookbook actually change behavior? So if we give it to families, can we actually reduce their food waste? So this got us thinking about uh, a study to do that. We created Supper Savers. Uh, Supper Savers was a feasibility study and a, to like, take a look at how our uh, intervention focused around family um, food waste could be implemented and whether or not it had any impact on some of those behaviors we're interested in. It was funded by the Known Institute of North America and their One Planet, One Health initiative. So we, when we were designing it, we realized there's actually not that many um, interventions that have focused specifically on household food waste. There's been about eight to date. And of those, none of them have focused specifically on families. And we were interested in focusing on families for two reasons. Uh, one is kids can often be an instigator for change in the family. Um, in my generation, it was uh, recycling. We were the ones who were pressing our parents to, you know, reduce or to, to recycle things. We're hoping this can be the same here. Getting kids excited about reducing food waste might be that instigator within the house. Uh, we also know that the habits that kids develop early in life can carry on to later life. So that's why we focus on families, specifically with kids age 9 to 12, so they can participate in these activities um, that we had in our intervention. In addition, only one other of these interventions focused on household food waste actually used a hands-on approach where the people actually develop skills versus knowledge um, in a really applied way. And we really wanted to, to do that because we know from health behavior theory that once you have uh, uh, developed your skills, your confidence increases and the chance you do the behavior increases. So we had specific, as you'll see, uh, hands-on approach to um, teaching some of those skills. So our intervention included a family uh, toolkit to reduce food waste. In the, food, in the toolkit, in, we included our Rock What You've Got cookbook, but we also included other resources to help families plan their meals, plan their groceries, store the food properly in their um, refrigerator to increase its shelf life. We also, the pink container you see there, that's a um, eat first container. So what we do with that is you put the uh, produce that you bought the week before as you come back from grocery shopping this time to let your family know these are the things you have to eat first before you eat the new apples I just bought today. And then up in the corner is a black uh, vegetable brush. And this has actually revolutionized my life. I no longer uh, peel carrots or potatoes. They get their brush, brush with, um, with this brush and no longer do those peels end up um, in the food waste. So thinking about our applied approach, we partnered with a local chef who did, worked in a community kitchen, and she ran an online cooking class for families. This was done during COVID. Uh, so she ran the cooking class where they made um, a roasted chickpea burrito bowl, uh, which is, again, one of our fridge cleanup recipes. You can use whatever veggies you have for that. Um, she ran the class and families cooked along with her. I was there to provide sort of food waste tips and help them walk through sort of what they had in their toolkit. Families were also sent text messages to reinforce some of those behavioral messages we had within our cookbook and class. Um, my favorite ones here, the fruit and vegetables are good for you, but only if you eat them. <laughs> We tested this among 19 families using a pre-post design, and we saw that there was some suggestion that we were able to decrease uh, fruit and vegetable waste, avoidable fruit and vegetable waste, at about 420 grams from before and after. So this is about, you know, three apples, for, for example. Parents reported greater confidence in decreasing food waste. 
And kids uh, told us that their knowledge of a, they understood what best was were they meant. So meaning at baseline, many of them didn't realize that actually food is just fine, can be just fine after. Uh, the language we used in our intervention is we called it freshest before. That's the freshest before date. And we also saw that families reported serving more vegetables um, after the intervention compared to before. This work um, was led by a uh, PhD student, Amar Leila. Um, his paper has been submitted to public health nutrition, so hopefully soon you can read it um, in a published, uh, published form. Because this is the first time we did this study, we also wanted to know what families thought about uh, supper savers, and they told us they enjoyed it. Both kids and parents found it fun and easy to follow. Um, they also told us they liked the tools we provided, and as you'll see at the end, it said they also love the potato brush, just like I do. So now, there, we think that Supper Savers um, program helped us think about promoting making more meals at home and also reducing food waste. But the one behavior we haven't talked about is increasing uh, plant-based protein. In 2019, Canada had released its new food guide, the first, one we, the first new one we had in 12 years. It was a substantial change. One of the big changes was we no longer had a meat and alternates group. Instead, we had a protein group. And the um, main message there was to increase your intake of plant-based proteins uh, in place of some of those animal-based proteins. We were interested to know from parents, you know, what did they think about the food guide? And more importantly, what could we do to help them meet some of those recommendations? What might be hard about making, meeting those recommendations? And what could we do to help? This was led by a postdoc. Uh, and uh, Lene, who's a uh, Brazilian student uh, with an excellent, who did this excellent work. So what we heard from parents is that they were somewhat unclear about what are we talking about when we talk about plant-based proteins. Um, they sort of said, Where, what, are, what are we talking about? I'm just not sure. Uh, one person said, you know, once you get past beans or lentils, I don't know what you're talking about. What are we thinking about when we think about plant-based proteins? The other interesting thing is in the Canada Food Guide, it talks about decreasing intake of processed foods. So this led to some confusion, you know, things beyond me is that, you know, should I eat that or not? It's a plant-based protein, but it's highly processed. So some confusion about what are we talking about when we think about plant-based proteins. We also heard from many, um, many parents that they were worried about their confidence in sort of um, preparing it. So they were interested, they thought it was good that there was this um, focus on plant-based protein, but were unsure if they knew how to actually prepare some of those, um, some of those products. So what did we do? We created another cookbook. Uh, this one's called Plant-Based Proteins Made Easy Peasy. Uh, for this um, cookbook, we partnered with Health Canada, who are the people who um, create our dietary guidelines. So this cookbook is both in English and in French, and is available at that same website as our Rock What You've Got cookbook. This um, has the same format as Rock What You've Got. At the beginning, it's some tips about how do you find, store, and prepare plant-based proteins, followed by 30 uh, delicious uh, um, uh, recipes that feature plant-based proteins. Some of them have a combination, so some will replace some of the animal-based protein with, with plant-based, but still have some animal-based proteins there too. My favorite recipe from here is a ramen. And I realize that's a fairly bold statement when I'm standing here in, in Tokyo. Um, it is actually a pretty delicious and quick uh, meal that almost tastes like takeout. So like um, our work with the Rock What You've Got cookbook, it's had fairly good uptake, the plant-based protein uh, recipe book. But we are also interested to find out, do those tools actually help families? So what we've done is work to combine um, our messages around um, promoting eating more more meals at home, um, increasing plant-based protein, and reducing food waste in a single intervention called Supper Heroes. This is an online program that is funded by the known International Prize for Alimentation. And so we are just in the process of developing this, and then we'll test it with families. I have three small things to say before I'm done here. One is just where you can find our cookbooks. It's at guelphfamilyhealthstudy.com. Um, there we have other cookbooks as well. They're all free, so help yourself. Um, you can find me. Here's my email as well as my Twitter. So I'd love to talk more about sustainable, healthy eating with any of you. And lastly, um, the prize that is funding our Supper Heroes work, uh, Denone International Prize for Alimentation, is a biannual um, 
uh, prize. It's fabulous. It's been really great to fund this great work and the graduate students who are doing it. So if you know of a mid-level career person who might want to apply for that, it'll be again in 2024. So keep your eye out for that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jess, for your excellent presentation and for promoting the team. Uh, we are at the end. I open the audience for two questions. I cancel my concluding remark presentation. <laughs> if there is any further question, you can go on Twitter. And last point, all the presentation will be available on the mini website. No question. Introduce yeah. yourself. Hello, I'm Priyana from Children's Microdefin. A really lovely talk, and uh, thank you for all the lovely work that you have done. I have one quick uh, question on uh, alternatives or a suggestion on what you could add perhaps to your next edition. In many countries, pickering and um, vegetable preservation is a big thing. So I wonder if you have explored along those lines. Such a great question, thank you. We do actually, so in um, Supper Savers, we've worked with these fabulous chefs who have great ideas just like that one. And so we have, there are short videos that families can watch on pickling. And we use the quick pickle, so it takes about five minutes because one of our goals with families is to make it quick. So it's such a great idea and such a good thing to do when that food is right on the edge. So thank you, that's great. Hello, my name is Ricardo Felorio, and my PhD is here for sustainability in the University of Barcelona. And my question was, have you thought on expanding these projects in other countries? Oh, I would love to. If anyone wants to collaborate, we have had the um, cookbook translated into different, uh, the Rock What You've Got cookbook on folks who are interested, uh, or in different, where there's researchers interested in having it translated. We are open to that. So please reach out. I'm happy to, uh, currently we're just doing it in Canada in English and French, but happy to talk about um, other languages or other um, adaptations. That would be great. Uh, I'm Ethi from uh, University of Indonesia. Uh, it's a, been a very fun uh, program and I like the tools and the information from your presentation. My question is how to maintain uh, the family, uh, the family, um, family intention to do, uh, to follow this program and uh, uh, do you have uh, like a budget, uh, special budget for each of the family to, to follow this program and how long it's? Thank you. Yeah, excellent question. Um, so we um, have not done maintenance measures, so we've only done pre-post, so we don't know how well they're sustained. Uh, we do try to highlight the tools and tips that they've learned that they can re, um, you know, anytime that they sort of get off course, they can get back on by, you know, using the same tips they did before to change their behavior. Um, and your second question. The budget support. Oh, budget, yeah. So we actually, the, the behaviors we focus on, we do try to make sure that they don't cost money. So making more meals at home should actually save you money, not increase money. Um, choosing plant-based proteins like canned beans, et cetera, should be less expensive um, than many of the meat-based approaches. And then reducing food waste, hopefully if you're using the food that you're already purchasing, hoping that it decreases cost. But we've never measured it. And now that you've said it, it's actually a good idea to see sort of what the cost um, um, is to families when they are trying to do our, our behavior thing. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. So thank you all of you here today. I think that one of the most important issues is our duty of each one to protect our planets by not only changing our eating habits, but also by living differently and I think we will maybe uh, obtain results in, in 2050. And thank you very much again and see you next time, see new UNS in Paris in a couple of years. Thank you again. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, there were uh, some uh, questions and, and comments in the chat actually was uh, uh, very lively. Uh, perhaps uh, uh, I'm calling to the, the stage Janet uh, uh, Ranganathan and uh, Sharon Donovan 
maybe you would like to provide a comment on uh, what's being uh, uh, said during the session. And, uh, and, and also about the questions that we received, the many questions we actually received in the chat. Uh, floor, floor is yours. And Jana, why don't you start? I'm sure. So actually, I thought there was uh, quite a lot of convergence um, across the speakers um, with the emphasis on um, plant-based diets, um, both for climate and I would also add nature reasons, but also for health reasons. Um, I, I thought the discussion on um, food loss and waste was timely as well, because if you think about uh, consumption-based strategies, shifting diets and food loss and waste are, are really kind of the, the two big approaches. It was good to have that piece on there. Um, I think there's a lot of alignment between the work that was presented, I think mainly from the Lancet EAT um, research report and the work that the, the, the WRI has done on creating a sustainable food future. Maybe one one area of difference there is on the emphasis that we gave to land and the fact that land has a GHG cost. Um, it just uh, only it only emphasizes more the importance of reducing consumption of land intensive products like uh, like ruminant meat. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll leave it there. There's some great questions in the chat. Um, I wasn't very good at typing, so please excuse all my typos. Um, but maybe over to you, Sharon. Yes. Well, I just would like to um, echo what you said and congratulate you on your presentation. And I, I think when this was designed, we really wanted to, you know, think globally and then think maybe countries and modeling and then, you know, get to the household level. Because, you know, I think to be effective or to get anywhere near we need where we need to be, we have to really be thinking at all these levels. And Whenever I hear these presentations, I have to say personally, you know, it's so easy to get depressed <laughs> and think, oh, my gosh, how are we ever going to solve these problems? But, you know, if we don't start, um, we'll never get there. And so what I appreciated in all presentations were, you know, actual realistic, whether they're attainable, but, you know, really recommendations on how we can start to address the problem and and hopefully you know, protect our planet. But I, I thought what was really important, you know, your three gaps, it's like, you know, we need to feed people too. And so we, um, I was listening to one of the questions. So I'd be interested to get your comment on this is one of the questions in the session. And I've heard this often, you know, it's, it really comes down to like an essential amino acid um, aspect. And, you know, we may need to actually eat more plant-based foods to to get the same protein or an equivalent protein quality of meat. So I'd be interested in your your thoughts on that or even anyone else in the in the chat. Um, so I'll, I'll give a stab at it. But first let me just make one one other observation about the presentation. So my my presentation really kind of started at the planetary scale. You know, we've got this greenhouse gas budget. We've got a finite amount of uh, land to use as working land if we want to keep the remaining ecosystems. And we still have to feed a bunch of people, and there's going to be a lot more of them. And what they're putting in their mouths are also going to be more land intensive as they as a global middle class rise. But then we kind of like shifted really quickly to thinking about what's on people's plates and what waste is happening in their fridge. Mm -hmm. And um, also what's happening at the field level at farms, because some of the impacts of the industrial agricultural system are very real. Um, but, but I think we have to reconcile those two worlds, um, because I, I often feel like a lot, of the, a lot of the kind of conflict and polarization in the food space now is around those who work at the field level and think about those impacts. And then others like myself who, who work more at the system level. And um, I think we have to bring those two worlds together because they're both realities and they're both correct. Um, in, in, in your, um, onto your question about um, plant-based diets and amino acids, um, I mean, I mean plant-based protein, I mean, there's the issue of, you know, you, you, you need to have the whole full spectrum of amino acids and plant-based, many plant-based um, protein sources don't have those. Some do, actually, um, mm -hmm. like, like soya. Yeah, but I think it's about sort of balanced diet, isn't it? I mean, and, and it's also, I think there's a myth here that you have to have all of the 
right balance of amino acids in every meal. Right. Um, now, I'm not a nutritional expert, so please correct me if I'm wrong here, Sharon, but I, I think it's that's now a myth being taken away. You don't need to have them at every meal, but it's like over the course of a few days, your body's able to put those into supply and, and bring them together. So um, I, I think we, we have to just sort of, I think we also have to think that people like the taste of meat. I mean, let's not get away from that. And I, I don't think, I don't think anyone I know in my area of work uh, uh, the researchers that we were are saying everyone has to become a vegetarian, let alone a vegan. I think it's like it's just moderating mm -hmm. the consumption of meat. Like people should still eat beef. Um, you know, we talked about reducing it to about one and a half burgers a week, so making it the treat. I mean, that's a fifty percent reduction on what the Americans eat, and maybe about a twenty five percent reduction on the average American. So it's not about eating no meat; it's eating right. less of it, um, and then eat you know eat quality meat. Right. Um, in order to create the planetary space so that people in developing countries that are eating very little meat right now might also be able to eat some more. So mm -hmm. maybe I'll put that back to you now. Yeah, well, and, and if there's any other questions here, please put them in the chat. We, yeah, we actually received a, a, a question. Uh, Janet, I would invite you to keep the, the, the microphone open uh, if, you, if, you, if you agree. Um, we we received a, a question from uh, Japan. I I hope I read it correctly. Does each recipe also estimate in terms of CO two GHG reduced? Uh, uh, for, and how how does that count for reducing food loss and waste? I think maybe they're referring to the recipe book. Um, mm -hmm. I, I haven't got a copy, but I would imagine that they do get that information. But um, Sharon, do you know? Yeah, no, I. I don't know, but I do think he is asking um, about the recipe book. And I, I did put in the chat, someone asked, um, I did find the book online, but it did look like she put a link where they might, it might be available. So people at that Guelph family health study.com. So you can check that out. Um, yeah, you're, we just, Yini took the lead on, um, Luis Moreno was the first author, but um, the, the article that was recently in Advances in Nutrition, which um, I believe that you you reviewed for us, that you know that was really this, and that's kind of in the mission now of Vini is this idea that you know there's there can be a place for all foods, and there can be certain times of the lifespan where, for example, pregnant women are going to you know need more iron, so that this idea of maybe the, the eat lancet could be too limiting in some places or, you know, for, for meeting nutritional needs at specific, you know, phases in early childhood or even in the elderly. So I think I'm echoing your comments about, you know, we need to do a much better job of how we raise animals so intensively. We need to um, really reduce the portion sizes. I mean, I live in the U.S. Midwest and, you know, people are routinely eating, you know, 12 ounce steaks and there, you know, there's no nutritional reason for that. And it's likely, you know, um, fueling the obesity epi epidemic as well. So it's really about, I think, retraining a lot of populations. And I think the U.S. is probably one of the worst in terms of what's an appropriate um, serving size of meat, like you were saying, you know, a burger a week. But, you know, even I like th this plate idea where people can see, you know, really how how does it um, look on a plate? And I see there's a comment about the role of making policies. Yes. I, I think that countries have a lot to do in this. I, I just saw, and some people may know this more than I do, but recently they just said in France that if you have if you can get to a city from an airport on a train in less than two hours, they're not going to have local flights anymore. And so, you know, these decisions, you know, I'm sure many people will be unhappy about them, but we can't continue to, to you know, work as business as usual or we're, we're not going to be surviving in the future. Certainly not at the, the quality of life that that we currently have. Maybe I could speak to the question about marketing strategies. And um, actually, I think it's really kind of critical. So we have an initiative at WRI that we run called Cool Food. 
And it's a collaboration of food services companies that have committed to cut their greenhouse gas emissions from the scope three from the this is emissions related to the sale of food by food services companies like Panier, um, some of the burger companies and that. And so we've worked with them to actually figure out, help them shift consumers when they come in to purchase food, um, to, to shift them to more plant-based choices. And, um, you know, some of the, the, the approaches are very simple and basic, like, for example, the menu. Um, if you put vegetarian food in a box, guess what? The people who look for that box are mainly vegetarians. If you integrate vegetarian food into the broader menu, um, they, the research finds that non-vegetarians are more likely to order it. No one wants to be in that sort of special box. Um, the language of food, like if you if you just sort of, I'm making this up, but if you put a dish like, I don't know, roast, you know, like boiled butternut squash with something on the side or opposed to sort of like roast butternut squash with a twist of ginger and I'm being very <laughs> elaborate here, but elaborate language really really does make a difference to how, how people um, order it. And we've also developed a label as well that, that we found that food service companies wanted some, this goes back to your plate comment, Sharon. Yeah. You know, like people want to know, is this meal, how, how, how do you label cool food? That actually created this huge analytical challenge for us. Is like, because you don't know what the, uh, the rest of the day the person's eating, but we, we, we try to identify like, you know, we, this, 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 this food, this luncheon that you're buying in a box or whatever, actually is a cool food because it actually significantly reduces your emissions below, below the average for your average person's lunch. Mm -hmm. So the cool yeah. food label is starting to catch on now. Those yeah. are some examples of working with companies. Yeah. No, that's, that's, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, cool food, cool, cool, cool yeah. food pledge. All right. Do do we have uh, any other comments or questions uh, from from our audience to share in the chat? You know, while while we're waiting for that, I mean, I'm I'm very happy actually. Like when we started out on our work on, you know, we published something on shifting diets in 2016. You know, people people didn't equate diets with a climate problem. Um, and so, so, but now you know, I mean, all all the presentations here and the interest, I think you know. You know, diets and food now is squarely on the agenda of, the, of, of, of people focused on climate action. What I hope now, though, is that, you know, if you think about how much investment there's been in renewable energy technology and trying to fix the industrial energy system, we need to sort of similar levels of innovation and investment going into the food system now to help it cut greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we've gotten so efficient at producing food that, you know, if we think about turning that that ingenuity and technology into, you know, thinking about how we can produce food with less um, less emissions. You know, I'm, I think the one thing I was struck with, I've seen you present this before, is really where are we wasting food in the system? And um, that's... I think many people are shocked, and 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 um, Jess Haynes reiterated that you know how much we waste at the household level, and and you know these are these are really easy education points. You know, people probably think, well, gosh, grocery stores throw away a lot, or restaurants waste a lot, but um, you know, thinking about it, I had a colleague who said they they shouldn't call their vegetable you know the crisper drawer they should call it the rotter drawer because yeah, that's people great. put things in it and forget <laughs> it and so um you know I, I really like this idea of increasing awareness but then giving individuals the tools um and the knowledge to actually yeah. act on that um because i know many many people who want to make a change but they they're not sure how to yep yep one of the interesting factoids that um, we've calculated in our work, I didn't mention it during my presentation, but if you actually calculate the GHG emissions with, you know, with an average American's diet, um, they're not really far off. They're a little bit low, but not really far off the average American's emissions associated with its energy use. And we use energy very inefficiently here. Um, likewise, in Europe, the same analysis showed that actually the, the average emissions associated with the average, average European diet was actually at the same order of magnitude of their emissions from everything else they did. So mm -hmm. these are, you know, this is a big, this is a big opportunity to reduce impact mm -hmm. and emissions. And, and by the way, it isn't just about climate I and mean, it's about, you know, reducing your emissions from um, food is also about reducing emissions from land. So it is also a biodiversity protection strategy too. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. Yep. Exactly. And you didn't talk too much about it, but I think, you know, we always have to be thinking of water as well as probably (laughs) we don't have enough land, but we're we're certainly running out of fresh water. And so, you know, and it's all together. So let's, we just need to keep having these conversations and education and policies and, and all across the board. But, um, and it's great. It's great that you, yeah, it's great that you allowed that with this, uh, with this seminar, Sharon. So thank you. Okay. Well, Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I know some of you are, it's the middle of the night almost. So I think we'll (laughs) We'll probably wrap this up. And and again, thanks for attending. We we really have enjoyed the interactions. Yeah, thank you. Okay, bye-bye.